Let's go right to the phone lines. First up is Daniel, Brooklyn, New York, listening on Sirius XM 131. Hi, Daniel. Hey, what's up, Hank? Um, long time no speak, and, you know, just as you're talking, I have to renew my membership to the Christian Research Journal because I have been slipping, and I, am, I know that I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do, uh, making myself equipped to be used in the hands of the Holy Spirit. So, um, great monologue, which you just talked right there. And um, I'm going to make sure that I renew this, um, my subscription. Uh, the question I wanted to ask, though, is a challenge that I have for my barber. And uh, pardon me, let me just go to my car so I can just uh, get out of the noise here. Um, my barber challenged me. He happened to be talking funny about uh, the debate, the second debate between Clinton and Trump, and somehow we got into talking about uh, Christianity and, and my reasons why I couldn't vote for Hillary. And he sort of went off on a tangent, but then we he centered in on David, uh, Old Testament, and how he was known as a man after God's own heart, yet he had concubines, he had several wives, he had Bathsheba, he had her husband killed, et cetera, et cetera. And it's believed that he made it into the kingdom. So his challenge was, why can't I be a David? Seeing that David got into the kingdom when I want to do what I want. And I gave him an answer. I wasn't too satisfied with the answer. So I was hoping, hoping that you can help me pinpoint and fine-tune my answer so that when I go get my haircut Friday, I'll have something better to say to him. Well, look, I mean, absolutely, David made it into the kingdom. He was Israel's quintessential king. If you read Psalm 51, he really genuinely repented. Remember him saying, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. And then later on, he says, you do not desire sacrifice, or I would bring it. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. So David repented. But look, this is not just about getting into the kingdom. The Christian worldview is not simply a contract by which you stay out of a bad place and you get into a good place. Rather, it is about how you can experience abundant life in the present. And with respect to David, and we see this in the Scriptures, David experienced the consequences of his sin in this life. The stories are horrific. The sword never left his family. So the idea that you can sin without consequence is a faulty notion, and the Bible underscores that. So yes, David was involved in all kinds of horrendous sin, even murdering a man so he could have his wife. And yet he was a man after God's own heart. Why? Because he repented. But the repentance did not in any way absolve him from the consequences. Those consequences follow inexorably like night follows day. Okay, so quick question. With um, one of the passages I brought up was the passage in Matthew where Jesus says to me, uh, Jesus says that uh, many will come to me on the last day and ask, Lord, Lord, didn't I prophesy in your name and didn't I do this and that? And he will say, depart from me, I never knew you. And my, my challenge to him was, are you certain that you will not fall into that category? And he says, yes. Well, you know what's no. interesting about you bringing that up, I think, by the way, very wise that you did, because this is exactly the opposite circumstance. I think Jesus may well have in mind Judas, mm -hmm. who was mm -hmm. prophesying in his name, driving out demons in his name, part of Christ's inner circle, and yet did not repent. I mean, he was sorry he got involved in the whole uh, tawdry mess, and he cast back the coinage uh, at the feet of the priests that had tempted him in the first place. But ultimately, it wasn't a change of heart. It wasn't genuine repentance. And that's why Jesus could talk about Judas as a devil, 
And the Bible can talk about David as someone after God's own heart because all of us have sinned in one way or another. And what Jesus makes really plain in the Sermon on the Mount is that if you think a murderous thought, you are culpable in the eyes of God. Now, thinking a murderous thought is not the same as murdering someone. The consequences are very different, but it underscores the severity of sin and the holiness of God. So all of us are faced with this exact situation. Are we going to be Judas and sin without genuine repentance or David and sin with genuine repentance? Now again, consequences we have to underscore because this is what your friend is missing. He's missing the consequence of sin. So it's not as though, well, you know what? I sin gravely against God's precepts and principles, but He's going to forgive me. I've asked Jesus to be my Savior. I'm going to get into heaven. No, look, when you sin, there are consequences. And that's why we confess our sins and we have our willer turned in the direction of doing it his way as opposed to our own. 